And I think it's really important when we start looking at the bravery and the courage of workers to speak out like this in this film, to pick up the response and carry it further with the privilege that we do have with status. And I think a political response to the state is absolutely part of a broad range of actions that we can do. The program is a construction of labor apartheid in our nation, which uh, is about empire building. And it's built on a much longer history of constructing Canada around 150 years of um, a colonial state, which has used over its history different labor programs, different immigration policies to construct um, uh, well, to deter racialized immigration and settlement in this country. And I think absolutely a, a political response to the state by writing letters, um, having MPs respond is uh, critical right now in terms of timing because this current liberal government has promised changes in the program. This summer, the, uh, the federal government convened a committee to look at the program and the committee was comprised of the three major parties and their mandate was to look at the program and to uh, suggest reforms. With that mandate, they only invited employers for their opinions on what they thought of this program. We know patently this is an uh, employer-driven program in which employers control workers' uh, basic freedoms and the structure of the program denies workers the ability of any labor and social mobility and speaking out the consequences are deportation or job loss or going underground. And um, when that committee only invited employers, activists like Justice for Market Workers, but also other activists involved in the coalition fighting against uh, the exploitation of the market worker programs, and that coalition is quite broad, trade unions, uh, people involved in the food justice movement, student activists, even um, farmers who recognize this is, this is uh, a program that uh, is patently exploitative. Um, but primarily it was activists from Justice for Market Workers who insisted you cannot review this program with the promise for change without hearing from migrant workers. And then finally, during the, the phase of the review, they did invite three workers to come to Ottawa to give deputations on their experiences. And that was the only way in which uh, their voices were heard. And I think if we're going to push the state for action, we have to do so with very um, vocal, um, but also not, not be satisfied with small crumbs of change, with small reforms, you know, to renovate a program which is rotten to its core, but which is drawing on much larger systemic problems with uh, colonization in our country, with questions about how food is produced, industrial scale agriculture itself. Um, and I think, you know, this is something I've come to realize with watching this film with audiences in diverse settings, whether it's in schools, or whether it's in bunkhouses with uh, migrant workers or in immigrant rights centers, I, I realize that this is an opportunity for us to insist on change, but to also start thinking about what kind of change we want, because oftentimes you get a change that isn't what you are asking for. So absolutely it's critical to uh, have MPs respond. To um, there, We had a screening at Parliament Hill, and none of the members of the committee came to the screening. Well, no, one member, the NDP member who organized the screening, but none of the other committee members did. And I, and I thought that was pretty disgusting because uh, workers took such a risk to come forward. And they um, did so believing in the power of documentary, believing many workers said they came to Canada because they thought the human rights situation in Canada as it's sold abroad, as it's sold internationally, um, they believed in that. And I think we've come to, we have to come to an honest accounting of the ugly Canadian and the reality of um, who's subsidizing the livelihoods here in our, in our country. So I agree with you, um, insisting on state action is important, but also mobilizing and organizing in our own communities and building our own strengths and, and putting forward uh, divergent ideas of what we want is equally important. I think the question about what we want is something we're in the conversation with now. And I, and I think this conversation needs to include workers' voices and workers' experiences. You're right, not every worker wants to settle 
and, 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 and be here. However, one of the campaign demands of the Harvesting Freedom Caravan was status on arrival, not pathways to citizenship. And the reason we insisted on that is because we have seen with the Live and Caregiver program, with the Filipino women who came here, the Caribbean women who've come here in the nanny program, that pathways to citizenship become a carrot that is dangled in front of women and uh, the pathway can become a 10, 15 year tortuous path to a citizenship maybe, but a, a lot of suffering, a lot of abuse, and then uh, a kind of a bittersweet reunion with families when, when, when citizenship is secured. Um, and when we talk about status on arrival, I know that some people have responded by saying, oh, that's so unrealistic and you know, not in this day and age. But consistently, persistently, historically, Canada has always given status on arrival to preferred uh, settlers. And going back to the Homestead Act, when 160 acres of free land were given to European farmers, um, when in the 1920s, women from Britain were invited to Canada to work as domestics and given status on arrival. In that same time period, women from the Caribbean were brought into Canada on bonded two-year temporary work permits and given no pathway to citizenship. So the construction of citizenship along racialized lines is persists and it's, it's historically, there's a precedent to it, but there's always been a precedent for status on arrival. So demanding that I think is central to reforming um, because that's central. If a worker has no status, if their um, very being in the country is tied to their employer, then they have no freedom to speak out. And I think what we're looking at is a modern form of servitude, indentured servitude. This June, I was in Qatar shooting in the migrant labor programs in Doha and in the Middle East. Right now in Qatar, there's a lot of construction going on for the World Cup, the 2022 World Cup and primarily workers from Nepal and from India uh, were working in the construction sites. And what really surprised me, what I didn't expect, was to see how familiar the migrant labor camps were to me. I saw so many echoes of Leamington and so many of the experiences that workers were talking about in Doha in, in the camps there were quite similar to what workers experience here. And I think this is something we need to recognize as a global uh, situation. It's not uh, unique to Canada. And for temporary for worker program, for uh, our opinion as an uh, uh, association, is very controversial. Uh, at the same time, there is no monitoring. Our demand, as uh, already mentioned, is uh, receive uh, uh, landed migrant as our brother sister uh, as a landed migrant, so that we have the same right. But also at the same times, however uh, you come the way you come to Canada, whether you pay or you don't pay, you will end up the same system. The systemic problem needs to be changed. And uh, one of our demand is also, once we are get here, like how we, do, uh, we, we don't have uh, employment insurance when you have a problem, how you don't have a service, uh, like uh, education, uh, access to the service, include to the language training, etc., then there is no path anyway to get be, to be a permanent. Moi, je suis arrivée ici en 2006 comme demandeuse d'asile. J'ai été refusée la même année. J'ai quitté le Canada, j'ai rentré chez moi, au Mexique. Et, mais à l'époque, la frontière était ouverte et puis euh, je reviens, je travaillais aussi par saison et ça veut dire que euh, j'ai travaillé dans tous les secteurs, inclusif agricole. Au centre de travailleurs, maintenant j'ai la grande opportunité de, euh, de, euh, de, de, de devenir euh, une organisatrice euh, communautaire et de partager mes expériences et de m'approcher à beaucoup de femmes qui ont vécu la même situation que moi j'ai passée. Au Québec aussi, ça arrive la même chose qu'à Ontario. Et puis, pour nous, autant que centre, autant que, que femmes et que femmes latines, ça a été tellement difficile de m'approcher à les femmes agricoles, saisonnières, provenant de Guatemala et le Mexique. Et 
euh, je sais, c'est un constat, qu'elles vivent dans l'isolation euh, complètement. Et c'est... Pour parler avec moi, les femmes euh, doivent échapper la nuit. Euh, après des 10 heures de travail, c'est comme 12 heures de travail, ça dépend. Et on n'a jamais euh, réussi à se rencontrer, à se parler, parce qu'elle avait beaucoup de peur. Et je parle de, de une ferme qui, à peu près, il y a 200 femmes, 150 euh, provenant du Guatemala, 150 provenant du Mexique. Et puis, euh, il y a toutes sortes aussi de rencontres, et de, de histoires là-bas, et, de pression, d'isolation, de criminalisation, parce que le patron a peur de que les femmes puissent parler avec quelqu'un, surtout avec des hommes, parce que sinon les femmes peuvent devenir enceintes. Et puis, c'est ça, c'est, c'est, c'est terrible aussi, qu'est-ce qui se passe ici au Québec. I think your bigger question is about how the program itself gives no incentive for employers to build uh, safe working conditions, to pay livable wages. The program uh, allows uh, workers, um, employers to keep the, um, the working situation in the status quo. So I think one of the challenges is to push forward um, some basic labor rights that are not two-tiered, where you don't have um, migrant workers here in Canada on tied permits uh, doing work that Canadians are rejecting because the work is substandard, because, and we often say it's the three Ds, dirty, difficult, and dangerous. But um, that work itself, the working conditions, the work pay, um, and um, security on the job, all of those which we expect are sort of the basic job benefits, in any, in, in any job, those should be applied for working on farms, but they're not because the program allows work employers to um, uh, keep the status quo. So I think peeling back the ways in which the program subsidizes the food we buy in the grocery stores, but also the tremendous profits that industrial agriculture is making in the greenhouses. And I think oftentimes when we think about farms, we're, we're not seeing the bigger picture of these farms. These are greenhouses that are 10 football fields in size, um, and they're operating 24-7. It's not a small farm, a small family farm of two or three you know, workers. And uh, with that kind of industrial scale business, is this an operating business model that we can you know, defend? And, and I, I think, it's, of course, it's important to address the, uh, the problems in the program. But in some ways, you have to, I, I've come to realize it's not a broken program. The program works exactly how it was designed. So the program is functioning flawlessly, in fact. These modifications themselves, they don't draw, um, we, that doesn't draw us to look at the bigger question of migration, of uh, immigration policies, how we produce food. This is absolutely a structural problem. This is capitalism. This is a problem of uh, racist capitalism uh, in operation, absolutely. So I think that a response to some of the issues raised in the program, um, we need to be looking at multiple responses. One, holding our elected politicians accountable to a federal program that is benefiting from, um, you know, uh, the labor program itself. But two, also to start asking about the construction of citizenship itself. And I was born in Korea, I came here as a four, when I was four years old, and yet I recognize that racialized people of color, we are permanent immigrants. We will never, you know, we are still never Canadian. My daughter goes to school and she makes a distinction, and as do the kids, she's in grade five, and the kids make the distinction in the playground between the Canadians, and that's white, and then the kids of color. And I think we're looking at racialized constructions of privilege and um, economic um, positions and jobs in, in our country, absolutely. So the, the program itself is part of a larger system within our country, absolutely. There was, there was a few reasons why 
we chose not to name the employer. The first was the safety of the workers. When we were filming over the three years, there were many scenes that we were filming with workers, which at the time I didn't know whether we could include it in the final cut, because I didn't know where the workers would end up, whether they'd be still working in that same farm, and if the film was released, then um, how that would jeopardize their livelihood. But um, as it turned out, all the workers, the Indonesian workers I was filming with lost their jobs in that farm for different, in different ways. And so we were able to build the story the way it was. But uh, so number one was safety of the workers. Number two, um, I've had experiences in the past with libel because I had done a documentary in 2000 called El Contrato and uh, I named the employers and they launched a libel suit against me for a million dollars and managed to shut down that film for a year. And it was only activists who were able to get it um, out and make pirated copies and get it out to greenhouses and, and workers and eventually the film was released. But having had that experience, I was quite careful around uh, libel issues. But finally, it was a very political decision because I think naming the employer would have personalized the story in a different way and drawn the attention to one bad employer. And I often hear that, oh, we know it's one bad apple in, in the cart. And I think that's not how, it's not a useful way to look at the program. The program, the card itself is rotten. So um, when there's an employer who will speak out and say, well, I treat my workers good. You know, they have, you know, really nice living conditions. They get breaks. I, I let them have water or a nice toilet or something like that. I just think that is not acceptable that we allow employers to audit themselves and to monitor themselves. And so it's up to the kindness or the charity of one individual employer. We need to look at the broader system itself. So the abuses are egregious and uh, they're deplorable, but the system itself is dehumanizing. And uh, I thought it was important to draw that broader context. I would be careful about calling for the program to be shut down. And the reason we don't say that is because workers don't want that. This is the means by workers can come into a place of employment, but status on arrival is the demand. So it's not about uh, eliminating the jobs that workers do have. It is a much bigger, more complicated picture of globalization, of looking at, uh, certainly looking at the material preconditions as to why workers are leaving homelands in the first place to be working separated from families for 25 years. I've, I've filmed with workers who have been apart from the families for over two decades or two generations of a father and a son working in a greenhouse. So I'd be careful about um, asking for the program to be called, uh, to be shut down, because that's not what workers are asking for. I agree with you, it's indentured labor, and it is a form of modern servitude, slavitude. Workers are constantly telling me, I feel like a slave here. I have no freedom. I think that our partners in labor, or our partners in faith communities, we have to see these communities as heterogeneous. They're not monolithic. There are regressive, conservative trade unions, and there are progressive ones. We have to be careful about partnerships with faith communities historically. There were, um, you know, the Catholic Church was responsible for residential schools. I, when you start talking about the legacy of faith communities in this country, let's be mindful of that true legacy. But the Canadian Labour Congress has been uh, partner and supporter of this film after they, have, they saw the film. So um, right now they're working with me in producing a French language version. And the film will be uh, screened in Ottawa next week at their Rise Up Human Rights Conference. Um, and there are other trade unions that have come forward to support the film and others who haven't had a very progressive stance on migrant workers and, the, and fighting for migrant worker justice. In fact, they're actually regressing to a xenophobic um, <clears throat> a very xenophobic argument of pitting migrant workers against Canadian workers and um, fighting for supposedly Canadian jobs and looking at the migrant labor program and workers are stealing Canadian jobs. And I think that argument will take us nowhere. In fact, it'll take us right back to the 1800s and we have to be mindful of that when um, I think people start using the fear we all have about our economic insecurity. You know, I live in Toronto and the GTA, it's common for people to have two part-time jobs just to pay the rent. And th that's a general you know, precarity and insecurity that we all feel. And I think a program like this builds on that.
frankly, the workers are so um, preoccupied with survival. Because once you lose your uh, work permit and you don't have a place of work, but you do have a visa to stay here, it's very tricky to live. How are you going to, as that boss said on the recording, how are you going to live? How are you going to pay for your food? How are you, you know, how are you going to... So workers have been very, um, you know, that has taken a lot of their time. Um, the Bali workers who, pers who began and initiated the small claim suit against their employer, uh, they're very close now to settling, uh, so they didn't have to go to the court, and I think they're settled with um, an agreement that they're primarily satisfied with. The employer saw the film was livid, um, but they were able to um, use the small claims court system to reach an, a settlement with that employer. Umi and Torques and uh, one other worker who testified against the recruiter, that criminal court case will be in Windsor Courts on October the 20th. Um, so we don't know, you know what's going to be the result of that. But Umi has fought very hard, as has Torkis and the other worker, to stay in the country. And it's been a real challenge. And they've done that with the support of Justice for Migrant Workers and other activists in the community. If they didn't have that support, um, this is why they wouldn't have been here. They would have been gone. And I think this is why it's so difficult to workers, uh, for workers to speak out and to use um, the criminal court system, for example. Or when they do, most oftentimes, the experience of the criminal court system is so awful. It's, um, it's like a re-victimization process. There were a group of women in a fish processing farm in the Leamington area, Mexican and Thai women who were being sexually abused by the employer. And um, they got together and managed to, uh, they testified, they went through the criminal case system, um, and they were, treated a bit, they were treated so poorly in the, in the, in the stands, the prosecutor um, basically mocked them, um, sneered at them, and said they were making up all the um, sexual abuse charges just to stay in the country. And uh, they went through that kind of abuse, and in the end, the employer got off of, you know, a few, uh, just a slap on the wrist. So why go through all that? Ultimately, um, two of the women persevered and went through a human rights tribunal case, and uh, last year, uh, they won the largest settlement in Ontario history in the human rights tribunal. But they had to go through six years of bullshit. So, um, our, you know, the different system, ways in which workers are fighting back and resisting, uh, they're not easy. At a screening, they were just in Hamilton the other day, there was a woman who uh, grew, grew up in Niagara-on-the-Lake, which is you know, a really beautiful wine country in Ontario, and a lot of people go for the B&Bs there. And in, if you go off the picturesque you know, main roads, in the back are the cabins where there's 26 Mexican women living in a, in a you know, unheated shack, and they're the ones picking the peaches. And yet they don't make the postcards of Niagara Wine County. And she talked about how she saw that growing up, but the, what she was told was you don't talk about that. That's not something that's polite to talk about. And I think once we start exposing uh, the realities of this program, we start piercing the myth of Canadian innocence. This is not a new program. We have had racialized labor programs in Canada since 1800s with Chinese railroad workers, um, you know, ongoing. And this construction, I think, you know, for us to turn around and say, oh, I didn't know it was happening when it's the 50th anniversary of the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, that's on us. We have to be accountable for that. What I think is really interesting is the way our media, mainstream especially, chooses not to cover a lot of this. Um, in the course of trying to get our, our film publicized, first when it was shown at Hot Docs in the spring, and then it was broadcast on TVO, just maybe three weeks ago now, we had uh, one of the top publicists in Toronto working for us, pitching hard to the major newspapers and major news outlets. And there was one particular newspaper outlet where there was a reporter very interested in telling the story, 
um, covering it. And um, his pitch to the senior editorial staff was rejected three times, he told us. And it was only towards the end of September that finally, I guess, they changed their mind and decided that, oh, instead of, no, no one's interested, this is an important issue, they decided to run a story. And I hope that's because the caravan was moving across Ontario at the time and, in fact, generating some media coverage. Um, so I think there's yet another layer going on here, which is how does our mainstream media stifle this story and how has it been doing so for decades? And, and how do we also force it so that more people in Canada are aware of all of this that's going on? Because if no one's aware of it, um, the struggle is just that much more difficult. Um, you can get a lot of information on our website, which is www.migrantdreams.ca. You should also look at the website of Justice for Migrant Workers. Um, and Harvesting Freedom, which was the campaign in September, the caravan across Ontario. Thank you for staying this long for those who have stayed as long as you have. And I think it's a real indicator of um, a commitment and uh, to wanting to see real change, to be part of real change in your own life, in my own life. I think we want to see that. I think that... Um, you know, right now is a moment of historic organizing and resistance with migrant workers organizing alongside activists in diverse communities doing coalition work. That Harvesting Freedom Caravan was amazing to witness. In its six weeks, there were about 20 stops from Leamington, Ontario on Labor Day, and they uh, marched to Ottawa. And along the way, you know, they went to farmer's markets and the police were called three times. In one rural community, a uh, farmer sent dogs after the caravan. Uh, but at the same time, they also met some extraordinary support from farmers, from students, from trade union activists, from people fighting um, immigration policies, people in uh, known as illegal and border politics movements. And it really, was a moment to see how there are ways we can gel together, but we can't do it without workers uh, leading the movement and their voices and their perspectives and their demands being front and center. Because any time we've ever had any progressive change um, with regards to this program in particular, it's when workers have organized. And I think the um, opportunity is there now. So. Um, I really do hope that, as Lisa was suggesting, you look at the coalition. There's a coalition for Migrant Workers Alliance, Justice for Migrant Workers, Harvesting Freedom Caravan. Um, there's so many multiple voices speaking out now on this issue. So it's an opportune time to, to be, um, get activated.